Therefore, it's now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Law Office. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. I have heard story after story from students and parents that have been positively impacted by Ontario's demonstration in provincial schools. Just look at each and every family here today. They represent the countless success stories and soon-to-be success stories. Blind, deaf and learning disabled students are able to flourish because of these schools. I have heard a student say that the demonstration school actually saved their life. Mr. Speaker, this government can't play games with the education of these children. Mr. Speaker, my, my question is very direct, very straightforward to the Premier. Will you commit to keeping the Ontario Provincial Demonstration Schools open for years to come? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to welcome all of the parents and the families here today. Um, it's very important that uh, that we have this uh, this conversation, and you're you're very welcome. Uh, thank you for coming to the legislature. Um, our government's committed to the success and well-being of every child in this province, Mr. Speaker. We're committed to giving every child access to the programming that they need. And I know. I know that there have been successes in the programming in the provincial and demonstration schools, Mr. Speaker. And one of the challenges that we have is that there are children, there are children who are not in the provincial and demonstration schools who actually need access to programming, Mr. Speaker, such as is in the provincial and demonstration schools. So we launched consultations to better understand um, how students uh, currently attending this, the provincial and demonstration Answer. schools are being supported, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I know the Minister of Education will. Have more to say about that process. Supplementary, the member for Prince Edward Hastings. Speaker, back to the Premier. This morning, the people of Ontario got to meet Lexi. Yeah. I had the chance to speak with 10 year old Lexi a couple of weeks ago at my constituency office in Belleville. And let me tell you, this is one intelligent girl who is as cute as a button. When we sat in my office, she had prepared text that she read for me. It was in a large font spaced out, and she did extremely well. But when I asked her to read something that I had on my desk that was in a 12-point font, Lexi struggled and she actually broke down in tears. And that's completely unacceptable that that should happen. She deserves a future just like other kids do, Mr. Speaker. She wants to go to Saganaska next year like her brother did and have the future that her brother now has. But there are kids like Lexi in every county and every city right across Ontario. Speaker, question. my question to the Premier is simple. Why does she think it's acceptable to put the education of students with severe learning disabilities in year-to-year -year chaos when it would be Shame. unacceptable for any other Shame. student? Shame. Shame. Thank you. Premier. Education. Yes, thank you. And I too would like to welcome the, uh, the, all the families that are here today from uh, both the demonstration schools and the provincial schools around the province. And uh, I, I, I want to respond to the member by saying uh, we get it, that the demonstration schools provide a wonderful program. The demonstration schools provide a very effective program, but what you're reporting, which is here is a child who needs the programming, there are thousands of children around Ontario who need the programming, and we need to figure it out how... You're going to start taking advantage of it. I'm going to start calling it. We need to figure out Answer. we need to figure out how can we deliver program to kids all over the province who can't read Thank you. because we want all the Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you and good morning uh, speaker. My question is for the premier. Marie DeRosier lives in North Bay and her daughter Amanda is enrolled at the Saganaska Demonstration School. She wrote to our leader Quote, without these schools, students like my daughter would not be employable because they would never make it through high school. 
My daughter is 15 years old and was reading at a grade one level in September of this school year. Today, after six months at Saganaska, she's reading at a grade three level with hopes of reaching age level reading with another, within another year. She continued, the closure of these schools will mean that these students will never reach their full potential. Speaker, will the Premier stand here today and promise Marie de Roger that these schools will remain open in the years ahead so that her daughter will have the opportunity to graduate Question. high school. Thank you. <laughs> Minister? Yes, and, and just to be clear, Speaker, I want everyone to be aware uh, that the, the application process for the demonstration schools, the uh, enrollment in the provincial schools for the deaf, will be uh, re continuing. Those processes are, are uh, starting up again for the 2016-17 year. So for any of the students who are currently enrolled at a demonstration school and are in year one of the program and who the school says require a second year, then those schools, those uh, children would be able to complete that second year. It's, it's the principals that actually designate whether the student should go for one year or whether they need to continue for a second year. But Answer. for those students who are in the first year of a program and the pr principal recommends they continue in the second year, Thank you. they will be able to do that. New question. The member from Leeds, Grenville. Uh, thanks, Speaker. My, uh, my question is for the Premier. Speaker, uh, parents from my riding with children at Belleville's Saganaska Demonstration School are among the hundreds here today. They've been spared for one year, but their fight isn't over. They've fought too hard to maintain these life-changing programs to risk what might happen after this year. As one mom in my riding told me, quote, this school will not just educate my child, but will change the trajectory of his life. Yep. If the government was truly listening to these parents like her, they'd stop trying to close these schools and work to put more kids in them. Yeah. Speaker, will the Premier guarantee that these schools will be open after the 2016-2017 year? And will she assure parents with us today that the families Question. won't be put through this again next year? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, as the uh, Minister of Education has said, uh, there was a consultation to uh, better understand how uh, students who are currently attending the provincial and uh, demonstration schools can best be supported, and, Mr. Speaker, beyond that, to determine how we can Order. how we can support these kids and their families, and how we can support the thousands of kids and their families. The member from Leeds Grenville. Finish, please. We can provide access to programs that are much needed for the thousands of kids and families who don't have access at this point, Mr. Speaker, because surely that is a point that we can agree on. That, of course, the kids and the families who are here are extremely important. But, Mr. Speaker, Answer. there are thousands of kids outside of these schools who also need support, and that's that's what we need to determine. How do we, as a society, provide access to all Thank of the you. kids who need the program? Okay. Supplementary, the member from Simple Gray. Back to the uh, Premier. Mr. Speaker, my constituent Ruth uh, Borshow's son, Nathaniel, struggles with learning disabilities. Last fall, Nathaniel was accepted to the Trillium Demonstration School in Milton. Ruth tells me he entered, grades, he entered grade 7 this year with zero ability to read. Today, he has now surpassed kindergarten reading and is moving to grade 3 reading. Ms. Borishow states her son's success at Trillium is incredible, and I agree. Speaker, Ms. Borishow told the Toronto Star yesterday, and I quote, they can open the applications and close the door again. They haven't told the teachers they'll have their jobs back in September. They haven't told the counselors and support staff they'll have their jobs back in September. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier please explain to educators why these issues remain unanswered and why Question. she's leaving such uncertainty out there. Have a heart, clean it up today. Thank you. Premier. 
Um, Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Education is going to want to speak to those, the logistics around the staffing, but Mr. Speaker, I just, I just want to be perfectly clear. I understand how important these programs are to the children and the families uh, who are here today, but Mr. Speaker, it is our responsibility to make sure that we don't stand in the way of a change that could actually provide more service and more programming to children across the province. So if the member opposite uh, is asking me, will we never change those opportunities? Will we stand in the way of other kids getting the program that they need? No, I won't commit to that, Mr. Speaker. I believe that the education system has to continue to evolve. My hope for this consultation was, and I said this to the Minister of Education before it started, my hope was that we'd be able to work with the families who have these Answer. programs and with the families outside of the programs to figure out how we can solve for the problem of the kids who do not have access to this Thank program, you. Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary, the member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Premier, your government is failing students and families who rely on your province's demonstration schools. Mr. Tourism, Culture, Sport. Like Robarts and Amethyst give young people opportunities to build their skills and their confidence and hope so that they can look ahead optimistically to the future. In a meeting just last Friday with families from my riding, I learned of a young lady who so honestly said, Speaker, that when she's sitting in a classroom full of classmates, knowing she learns differently, she never feels more alone. Premier, Speaker, that's not the inclusion these young people deserve. This young lady wants to learn amongst her peers. Despite the short-term solution that we heard the minister announce yesterday, the Liberals have done nothing Question. to help families plan for long term. So we need to hear from the Premier today. Will she commit to all of the families from Huron and across Ontario today Thank you. that she'll remove the cap here, and here. keep the school? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. And, uh, I just want to clarify the situation. Uh, the formal consultation process ended on April the 8th. Uh, I'm actually still having some meetings uh, with various parties, and uh, so we haven't made any decisions yet of, uh, um, in terms of how do we provide programming in the future. As Order. the Premier has noted, we want to find a way that will provide good, solid programming of the nature provided a member from Prince Edward Hastings. schools in a variety of, of locations. Uh, so we, but we haven't made any decisions about how we, do, how we do that. But what I can assure you is that we have also not we didn't just notify the media of the decision. Before we did that yesterday, we notified the unions, we notified the, the principals, we notified. Thank you. I stand, you sit. Uh, I'm trying to speak. I stand, you sit. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. For months, families and students with exceptional learning needs have pleaded with this government to keep their schools open. They've organized, they've gathered thousands of signatures and rallied from Belleville to London. Today, hundreds of uh, families from across the province join us here at Queen's Park, united for one reason and one reason only, the future of our provincial and demonstration schools. It boggles the mind to think that this Premier doesn't see the value in schools that help some of our most vulnerable children. It all comes down to priorities. Children should always be our priority, Speaker. They should always be our priority. Will this Premier listen to families and commit to keeping these schools open long term, or will she turn her back Question. on our most vulnerable children? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, as I said, uh, 
our priority actually is all the children in this province. It is absolutely fundamental that we provide the programming that uh, kids need, the supports that they need, which is why, Mr. Speaker, uh, we value the programming in the provincial and, and uh, demonstration schools. We know that there are aspects of those uh, programs that are very, very successful, Mr. Speaker, and we want to make sure that as we go through this process that we provide opportunities for the thousands of kids and the thousands of families who don't have access to, uh, to that program, Mr. Speaker, to that, those programs, that we provide those opportunities so that every child in the province gets the, uh, gets the opportunity that they deserve. Thank you. Supplement. You know, Speaker, the, the Premier has the final word when it comes to prioritization of what this government sees as important. And I guess vulnerable children just don't check the boxes for the Premier when it comes to priorities. Families should not be forced to fight for the opportunity for their children to thrive. <clears throat> Provincial schools for the deaf allow students to be immersed in an ASL or LSQ environment, essential for individual expression. Demonstration schools boost reading comprehension and confidence for students with exceptional learning needs. Will this Premier Question. confirm that her government has no plans to close any provincial or demonstration school in this year or next year or in the long term, Speaker. Thank you. So, seated, please. You're seated, please. Thank you. I cannot, in good conscience, say that we will never change anything about the delivery of programming and education, which is exactly what the Leader of the Third Party and the Leader of the Opposition are asking. I cannot, in good conscience, say that as we as we see changes in society, as we see changes in, in health, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, I know that there's a huge debate about the programming for uh, deaf and deafblind children, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the availability of uh, ASL in our schools and LSQ, Mr. Speaker. It's something that I dealt with when I was, uh, when I was Minister of Education and a former member here, Gary Malkowski, worked with me so that we could change regulations so that there would be more ASL delivered in our schools. I understand Answer. that there are debates that have to be engaged. One of those debates is how do we make sure that programming that works for kids has the opportunity to work for all kids in the province who need it? Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Speaker, closing enrollment without notice to families and students for these schools was the wrong thing to do. It was a callous and inappropriate move for this government to take. What did this premier think? Speaker, what did this premier think was going to happen? Of course, students and families rallied to try to save the very thing that they need to make sure that their kids could reach their potential. Speaker, for months, for at least a month, New Democrats have been raising this issue in the House, and for a, wh a while now, this government has dodged any commitment to actually backtracking on their the wrong of decision. And and sports, so now time. here we are, hundreds of people on the lawn of the legislature this afternoon. This government has made a commitment in a small change of direction Question. for September. But what all of these families and all of these people need to know is that the change is permanent and they will not close the demonstrations and provincial schools in this province. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, again, I will say that what the leader of the third party is asking is that we that we determine that it is impossible to provide 
more programming and more opportunities for the thousands of kids who are not in these schools. What the leader of the third party is saying is you can't change. You cannot change the delivery of program in, uh, in this province. Mr. Speaker, that's just not reasonable. We have to be able to work Member with, from Windsor West. with the families. As I said before, one of the conversations that the Minister of Education and I had was how do we work with the families to determine what's in the best interest of the kids who are here today and the kids who are in these schools and, and accessing these programs. But beyond that, what is the solution for the kids who are not in these schools? So the, uh, the enrollment has been Answer. reopened, Mr. Speaker, but final decisions haven't been made. And I pray that we have the opportunity to work with families to come up with solutions that work for these kids and all of the kids Thank in you. the province, Mr. Thank Speaker. You see that, please? You see that, please? New question. The leader of the third party. The Premier Speaker, I don't understand why this government thinks they need to rob Peter to pay Paul. It seems they do that on every single file, and it's the wrong thing to do, Speaker. You know, it's good to see that the Premier can admit when she's wrong and overturn some of her bad decisions, whether it's backing off on a plan to double drug costs for seniors, lifting the freeze on enrollment at the provincial and demonstration schools, or backing off on bad regulation changes for childcare. When will the Premier reconsider her undemocratic plan to change elected election financing, law financing laws and open the process to include non-partisan panel? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, I believe that the House leaders are uh, meeting uh, either today or in the very near future to talk about what the, uh, the committee process will be, Mr. Speaker, as we uh, move to bring legislation forward in the, uh, in the spring, in the next uh, few weeks, so that we can move to getting legislation to first reading, Mr. Speaker, and have a broad consultation across the province after first reading and then again after second reading, Mr. Speaker. So I'm looking forward to that input. I'm looking forward to that discussion that should take place into May and June and into the summer and then into the fall, Mr. Speaker. And I look forward to all of that input as we together move to what I believe uh, is a, a fair there's a fair degree of consensus in terms of the changes that need to be made to fundraising, but we need that input in order to get it right. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier is making a mistake by writing new election laws by herself without prior consultation with civil society, other political parties or Ontarians. At a time when people, Speaker, are increasingly cynical about politics, one party changing election rules all by itself is only going to make people more cynical. Will this Premier respect the democratic rights of Ontarians to have a say in their own electoral system and open up the process. Mr. Speaker, the, the process that we're putting forward, given that there is a, you know, there is a broad consensus, so there, there are other jurisdictions that have moved on many of the changes that we're proposing, the federal government, uh, some other provinces, Mr. Speaker. Given that, and given that we're proposing that we bring legislation, we move to consultation after first reading across the province, and then again after second reading, that, Mr. Speaker, is quintessentially the democratic process. That is how, that is how this legislature works. That is how decisions are made. It's not one party. That's the role of the legislature, Mr. Speaker, is to bring forward legislation, to have a debate, and to listen to that debate, and then to make changes based on it and to move forward. That's what we're going to do, Mr. Speaker. And I look forward to the input. As you know, I asked for input from the uh, leaders of the opposition parties. I hope I will hear from Answer. them, Mr. Speaker, as we draft the legislation. But for sure, we will hear from people across the province as we go into the consultation, Mr. Speaker. I don't supplement. Well, Speaker, what a difference a little bit of power makes. <laughs> Members of the Liberal front bench once called it anti-democratic uh, to unilaterally change election law, Speaker. They saw, rightly, that changing election laws without consensus and public buy-in is bad for democracy. People deserve to know that our democracy is fair, Speaker, and the party writing the rules doesn't have its thumb on the scale. This Premier, who is instrumental in creating the system of ministerial quotas, appearing to sell access to government decision-makers, and shaking the public trust, 
is not one to be now changing the rules on her own. Will this Premier open up the process of updating campaign financing to a fast-moving, independent panel and start to rebuild Ontario's trust in their government? Thank you. Thank you. Government House Leader. Coming well, thank you very much, Speaker. I, I really Let's don't understand, Speaker, why the, the NDP leader is undermining the role of the legislators. We are exactly elected for the sole purpose of developing legislation. That is exactly the job that is given to us by the people of Ontario. Speaker, you don't need a grade 10 civic lesson to know that. I, I hope, I don't know what she tells when she goes to her schools in, in grade 10 classes as to what the role of the legislators is. It is to bring forward legislation. It is to hold public consultations. It is to listen from, uh, from, uh, from Ontarians. It is to then make amendments through the clause by clause process. Speaker, I look forward to speaking with the other House leaders this afternoon to talk about how we can develop a process that will ensure that Ontarians from across this Pro a great province have an opportunity to provide their input, experts to come forward Answer. to provide their input. Speaker, that is our role as legislators. We should be doing our job by, by following suit. Thank you. Okay. New question. The member from Thank you. Order. Member from Sarnia Lamb. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Minister of Education this morning. Minister, today there are five families in Sarnia Lambton who are counting on the life changing education that their children receive at the Amethyst Demonstration School in London. There are dozens more whose children have graduated from the intensive program at Amethyst and are now thriving in this secondary and post secondary education. There are even more families, uh, Madam Minister, eager to apply for admission to Amethyst, knowing in their hearts that the education their children receive from this school will change their child's future forever. Yet these families fear that this government is preparing to close Amethyst. These concerned parents and students I've met with have contacted my office and described the Amethyst Demonstration Schools as essential, a blessing, and their last hope. Minister, will you commit today to keeping Amethyst open, not just for current students, but also for future enrollment by students from Sarnia Lamp and across Ontario? Thank you. Minister, and I want to make it clear, Speaker, that we're concerned about all special needs school students, wherever they may be in the province. And it's precisely because we're concerned about the school students who are deaf, deafblind, or who have severe special uh, learning disability needs. It's precisely because of that that we started the consultations in the first place, because we want to figure out how we can provide the best program possible, uh, particularly for all those students with severe learning disabilities and for all those students in southwestern Ontario or uh, in eastern Ontario who are, hard, who are uh, deaf or hard of hearing. It's because we are concerned about those students that we enter Answer. into the consultations. At this point, no decisions have been made on the outcome of the consultations. Thank you. Supplementary. Member from Melbourne, Middlesex, London. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Minister, you started the consultations, but you shut down enrollment and you refused to offer future yeah. employment for the teachers that are working at these schools. Why would you do we that? think you're thinking something else during this process. I believe so. But thankfully, you realize you made a mistake, and because of the parents are here in the protest, here. you started the admittance process again. I have a constituent of mine, and due to his age, Josh, this is his last chance to uh, have a hope for his future. But your government's only committing to one year for Josh, and most students need more than that. Minister, the application process alone takes a year to start. Wow. Your actions today will deter students from applying for next year. Chair, sure, please. And due to uncertainty, Mr. Speaker, sorry, the school system may not get the necessary applications, leading to your argument that there's not enough students for the programs. Mr. Speaker, Will the minister commit today to keeping the Robart School for the Deaf, the Amethyst Demonstration School open Question. in London beyond this coming school year, or was her decision yesterday simply to shut her down the Thank protest? You. Here, 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 here. 
Thank you. Minister. Uh, as I noted earlier, the formal uh, consultations ended on April the 8th. At one of the meetings that we had with the parents, the parents had said, would we reopen uh, the process for this year, so that people had already put together the binders, put together the psychological testing, and I committed to them at one of the parent meetings that once the formal consultations were over, we would look at whether or not we would reopen the process for this year. I followed through through on that commitment when the formal consultation process was done. We announced yesterday that, in fact, the application process is open again for the 2016-17 years. That's exactly what I committed to determining. I determined that the process is open for the 2016-17 year. Thank you. New question? The member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. The government keeps saying more children need access to specialized program, programming that's available at demonstration and provincial schools. So why did the minister cap enrollment in the first place? If more children need access to these programs, why are they even thinking about closing them? It just doesn't make sense. Children with exceptional learning needs deserve better from this government. We know these programs are successful. The minister herself admits it. Will the minister tell families in the gallery and those that are at home today that the provincial and demonstration schools will remain open after the 2016-2017 school year? Well, as I, as I just said, we're, we're just in the process of completing the consultations. We're reviewing the information that has come in, and no decision has been made uh, as a result of the consultations. But we do respect the fact that these are highly successful programs, and that's why we have reopened uh, the admission to ensure that those who have submitted their applications uh, for the 2016-17 year, that that, that that process will go forward. And uh, that we, we are committed, though, to figuring out how do we manage to serve kids with severe learning disabilities from all across the province? There are children from all across the province with severe learning disabilities who are not Answer. being adequately served right now. And that's a problem we need to fix. We need to make sure that Thank students you. all over the province Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister of Education. This government is failing vulnerable children. Their spin doesn't make sense. In fact, the minister's own briefing note that I obtained through a Freedom of Information request shows that the consultation process ends with a discussion with unions on details of staff impact. That directly shows that they were considering closing these schools all along. Seems like the minister started consulting with the end goal of closing schools without actually listening to what was said. And, Speaker, that is shameful. Today, the minister should listen to children and families, listen to what these schools have meant to them. Children are begging the minister to listen. Again, will the Minister of Education guarantee that these important schools will stay open beyond the 2016-17 school year? Will she make a long-term commitment to these worried families? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. What I, what I will commit to is that we want to find a way to serve all the children in the, proce right. in the province right. with severe learning disabilities. Yeah, really the fact that we have heard over and over again from children and families all across the province that children who have average or above intelligence who are in grade 7 or grade 8 or grade 9 or grade 10 are unable to read beyond a kindergarten or grade 1 level. That says to me that we have a problem, and there's a problem that we need to solve and that we need to make a commitment to all those students that we are looking at how do we design programs to best serve children with severe learning Answer. disabilities all over the province. That's what the cons consultations are about. Thank you. Your question, the member from the Glengarry Prescott-Russell. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children and Youth Services. 
Uh, speaker, I'm sure I speak for all members of the ho this House when I say collectively that we were deeply saddened by the tragic news in At Attawapiskat this weekend. The First Nations community of less than 2,000 people saw 11 people try to take their lives on Saturday night. This community Order. has seen over 100 suicide attempts since last September, and uh, the community declared a state of emergency over the weekend. And I know uh, that the Minister of Children and Youth Services and the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care uh, visited Attawapiskat yesterday. Can the Minister of Children and Youth Services please update this House on the visit and what was heard from the community of Attawapiskat? Thank you, Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Glengarry Prescott Russell for this very important and serious uh, question. And yes, I did travel yesterday with the Minister of Health to the Attawapiskat community to speak, not just the community, but the youth themselves, uh, Speaker, and their leadership. And we heard how we must all work together on short, medium, and long term solutions to address very serious challenges facing this community and their youth. Our government will be providing additional assistance to the community following the government's emergency medical assistance team, also known as an EMAT assessment, an EMAT reconnaissance team working with the local Bound Council, as well as the Winnebago Area Health Authority, to determine how EMAT can best provide assistance in this community. The assessment led to some very important action, Speaker, our government will be taking, Answer. which will be touched on in the supplementary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Speaker. And it sounds, uh, Minister, like our government took immediate action to address the crisis in Attawapiskat. But, Speaker, we've heard time and again that, there, uh, that these underserviced areas face serious and chronic problems. And a visit from the ministers, while it's informative and important, it's not enough if we're really going to address the epidemic problems the First Nations communities face, like Attawapiskat. Did, speaker, through you, did the minister come to any agreements with the community about the best way to move forward so that Attawapiskat will receive the full supports that they need? Thank you, Minister. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we uh, are actually right now deploying 13 health care personnel, including mental health workers. We're providing $2 million in support. But I want to speak to just how moved Tracy and I were in Attawapiskat Adewata yesterday. The incredible leadership demonstrated by the local chief, Chief uh, Shashish, the band council. Uh, we were accompanied by Perry Bellegarde, who is the, uh, national, uh, the national chief of the Assembly of First Nations. But the youth that we met, and we met dozens of youth, Mr. Speaker, who are demonstrating such tremendous courage and determination. All we need to do, Mr. Speaker, is follow the path that they themselves have set out for us to follow in terms of providing not just the immediate support that we announced yesterday, but that long-term support to restore their hope, to restore their futures. We Answer. stand side by side with those youth, with the local leadership and the community, and Perry Bellegarde to make sure that we're working hard and with our federal partners to solve this crisis, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister. Seated, please. please. Thank you, Member. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. Minister, my constituents are concerned about the current situation regarding demonstration and provincial schools in Ontario. Ontario has recognized its duty to provide education to deaf students for well over 100 years. My constituents, like Anne and Harold Wall, are worried that without dedicated schools for deaf children, these children will not have the full ability to participate in academic, social and extracurricular aspects of their education. How can they learn when they don't have the opportunity to communicate? Minister, will you do the right thing and eliminate the ongoing uncertainty, anxiety and the fear of closure of the demonstration and provincial schools in Ontario? Yes or no? Thank you. Minister? 
very much. And, and you mentioned uh, schools for the deaf, and I believe that uh, students who live in your riding would be going to the school for the deaf. The Drury School for the Deaf in Milton would be probably the usual placement, or partly, possibly at the east end side of your riding, it might be Whitney and Belleville. And I have said all along that uh, we will continue to be operating the School for the Deaf in Milton, Drury, and the School for the Deaf in Belleville. Whitney. We, we understand that uh, those are the schools that uh, offer a program in ASL, American Sign Language. ASL is the teaching language at those two schools for the deaf, and, and uh, we, we uh, have committed right from the beginning that those Answer. are not schools that we have been consulting on, uh, that certainly those can, schools will continue to operate, and Thank you. Uh, that that is not. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Chris Sonderbahn from Shakespeare attends Amethyst Demonstration School. This specialized school environment has increased his confidence and his learning has progressed at an exceptional rate. Without Amethyst, his family tells me they don't think he could have graduated high school with a diploma. And, Speaker, his mother Cindy put it best. She says, our students did not create Ontario's deficit, and we should not jeopardize their future to fix it. Here, here. <laughs> Speaker, will the minister please explain to Chris and his family why she is willing to jeopardize his future? Will she do the right thing and guarantee— the minister, the minister of Sport is uh, warned. Please finish. Yeah. Okay. Speaker, will she do the right thing and guarantee that Chris's school will remain open? Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. First of all, I want to assure everyone that this is not about money. This is about how do we provide the best programming possible to schools who, to students who are deaf and to students who have severe learning disabilities. And it's because, precisely because of people like Chris who have been able to attend the program and who have been successful in the program that they have graduated and gone on to employment. It is because, precisely because we see that, that success that we want to look at how can more students enjoy the success of, uh, of, uh, the, the member from Huron Bruce, come to order. It has nothing. Excuse me. Excuse me. The second time today, please. When I stand, you sit. And the member from Huron Bruce just kept right on going when I asked her to come to order. You have one wrap-up sentence. Let me just assure people that the reason that we are looking at the consultations is so that we can do a better job for our still children. Thank you. That needs. New question. The member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the President of the Treasury Board. Two days ago, more than 200 parents came to the legislature to make their voices heard on, your, on, the, on the minister's autism funding mistake. Instead of properly investing to ensure all kids with ASD, regardless of age, receive the supports they need, the minister decided to try to make a good news announcement out of kicking kids five and over off the list for life-changing essential therapy. In the end, Speaker, this minister holds the responsibility for the books. Where are her priorities? Why are they not helping some of our most vulnerable kids? Why is she trying to balance the books on the backs of kids with ASD? Will the minister explain to families of kids? Jim. Stop the clock. Well, that's not endearing you to me. Please finish. 
Thank you, Speaker. Will the President of the Treasury Board please explain to families of kids with, with children with ASD over the age of five why she doesn't think Thank they're you. worth helping? Uh, Speaker, I'm, I'm afraid that this question demonstrates a very serious problem in the caucus of the third party, Speaker. The budget they voted against yesterday included $333 million additional dollars, additional dollars for kids with autism. So they can stand up and complain about what we are doing. We added $333 million to kids with autism, and they, they somehow interpret that as a cut. That's irresponsible. It's very unfortunate. It is, it is unfair to the parents of kids with autism to suggest that we are cutting services when, in fact, we are adding $333 million to service kids with autism. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Supplementary. Speaker, the families and kids in this province know where the problems are coming from, and it's Member certainly not Trinity my backyard Spadina. that they're looking at. I don't know how this minister sleeps with herself at night. Speaker, as experts and parents have laid out, it's either pay now or pay later. Minister of Help Municipal Affairs and Housing. Help kids skills for independence or pay later. The minister has to live with the fact that her funding decision, according to the experts, will leave kids with ASD with higher rates of behavioral dif difficulties and possibly worse. Institutionalization, a life confined to a room, or even their own bed. We've seen what this looks like, Speaker, and it's devastating. This is not the future for kids with ASD that they deserve in this province. With the stroke of a pen, she can Question. reverse this decision and ensure that kids with autism get the IBI that they so desperately deserve. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. In fairness to uh, the kids with autism in Ontario and the parents and families of kids with autism, the NDP should be recognizing that 16,000 more kids are going to get access to evidence-based care for autism. Speaker, 16,000 more kids. Only the NDP could characterize 330. Finish, please. Only the NDP could characterize an additional $333 million as a cut. But, Speaker, that's not the only thing they voted against in yesterday's budget bill. Speaker, they voted against free tuition for low-income and middle-income kids. Free tuition, an absolutely transformational change Answer. in this province. And the NDP, who used to be the champion for low-income people, has turned their Thank back you. on them and voted against them. New question? The member from Etobicoke Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Uh, Minister, yesterday this House passed Bill 173, the Jobs for Today and Tomorrow Act, and this piece of legislation is, of course, adjacent to our 2016 budget, which will help to make Ontarians' everyday lives better. As a business person, Minister, you know you and I have spoken on a number of occasions, and as a business person, you know that I'm a passionate advocate to make sure that we're building a strong economy and supporting creation of jobs. The Jobs of Today and Tomorrow Act also outlines the next phase of our government's plan to do just that while helping people to reach their full potential and succeed in an evolving economy. Speaker, could the minister please inform this House about how the 2016 budget and budget bill will improve the lives of everyday Ontarians? Thank you, Minister yeah. Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Etobicoke Centre for the question. As the member said yesterday, our government passed the Jobs for Today and Tomorrow Act. The 2016 budget is part of our government's economic plan to build Ontario up and to deliver its number one priority to grow the economy and create jobs. 
The four-part plan includes investing in talents and skills, including helping more people get and create the jobs of the future by expanding access to high-quality college and university education. The plan is making the largest investment in public infrastructure in Ontario's history and investing in low-carbon economy driven by innovative, high-growth, export-oriented businesses. Mr. Speaker, the plan is also helping working Ontarians achieve more secure retirement. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Uh, you know, many of my constituents have expressed support for a number of very important elements of this budget, in particular the record investment in public infrastructure, uh, the investment in community care and palliative care, uh, the free shingles vaccine. Um, and as a member of Treasury Board, Minister, I am proud of the work that not only Treasury Board, but you, our Premier, our, all our Cabinet, our caucus have done to make sure that we're working towards a balanced budget by 2017-18 while protecting the services that everyday Ontarians value so much. Minister, could you tell us what other measures were enacted yesterday by the passing of the 2016 budget? Good question. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to answer the question from the member from Etobicoke Centre who's been a champion on Treasury Board as well. And as the member said, Ontarians cons we consulted with many Ontarians about their priorities and their values, which the government has planned, which our plan is outlined in the 2016 budget. Unfortunately, yesterday, the opposition decided to let politics get in the way of supporting these initiatives that will help Ontarians both today and tomorrow. For example, yesterday they voted against $400 million to the business growth initiative to invest in our plan to grow the economy and create jobs. They voted against transforming student financial assistance to make it more upfront and affordable. They voted against providing an additional $1 billion for health care and increasing hospital-based funding. They voted against ensuring Ontario leads the low-carbon economy that will ensure $1.9 billion in reinvestment in green projects. And worse yet, Mr. Speaker, they voted against making everyday life easier for Ontarians yes, by eliminating fees and costs like a drive clean and lowering hospital parking costs. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Your question, the member from Nepean Carlton. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. In my family, someone I love grew up with a severe learning disability. Because of proper training, he's now grown up to become a professor, take a PhD, and rise to very senior positions in the government of Canada. I didn't fully appreciate his struggles until I heard Lexi, a grade five student this morning who wants to continue to go to Saganoska, read to us. It was incredibly emotional. She deserves to thrive just as those like her brother did before her. Responses from your government today have been less than reassuring. Their non-committal is increasing anxiety, not just here in the gallery today, but I'm sure across Ontario. My constituent, Kelly Foley's son, attended Saganoska. She called the school life-changing. Her son has been able to thrive Question. and succeed because of that school. I ask the minister to have some compassion today, provide some long-term clarity to the people in this gallery, and to make sure that those schools remain open without a cap and that there's a long-term plan. Here, here. Thank you. You see the please? You see the please? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, as I've said, we are very concerned about kids who have severe learning disabilities. We know that in the case of some of the children who are uh, attending or who would like to attend the demonstration schools, that there is a significant gap between their age level, their presumed grade level and their access to reading. We know that for some of the children, they've been in special needs programs at their local school board and they've been unsuccessful, and that the program that's delivered at the demonstration school is excellent and has been successful. We know that there are others, like your relative, who have successfully had programs delivered in their local school boards so that they've been able to learn to read. We need to figure Answer. out how can more students have success. That's the purpose of the consultation, is to figure out more Thank you. how more students can... Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Mr. Speaker, and back to the Minister of Education. 
This Liberal government says it's for the people, about the people. That's but when put says. to the test, nothing could be further from the truth. Exactly. They are cutting provincial and demonstration schools for children and students with special education needs and who are blind, deaf, or deaf blind. The minister says it's not about money, but Mr. Speaker, they fired 50 education teachers in my riding, special education teachers, and now they're threatening to close provincial and demonstration schools. This Liberal government's waste and management is seriously undermining special education services across Ontario. And for parents of children with complex and special needs, it's catastrophic. Speaker, why is this minister telling parents in my riding, like Melanie Denny and dozens of others, their children are getting more special education dollars when, in fact, she is cutting core special education resources and it's closing true. schools or threatening to close schools across it's Ontario? Good question. Thank you. Minister of education. Okay, let me try and correct the list of bits of misinformation there. <laughs> true. Somebody said there's not. The, 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 the minister will withdraw. Withdraw. Carry on. Um, the, firstly, we are not looking at the schools for the blind. The provincial school for the blind, of which there is only one in Brantford, we'll get the name of the city right, uh, is, is continuing. The school at Brantford actually does the programming for the deaf blind, uh, at least in the English language side. Uh, we are, in fact, have already said that we're not closing the AS schools for the deaf, the, the uh, two big ones at, um, in Milton and Belleville. So the idea that we are closing all these schools is just simply wrong. What we are doing is looking at how we can provide better programming for, uh, for, for children who are deaf because we are concerned about the programming at some of the schools and how we can provide Thank you. A better spec. Your question, the member from Bremen, Moulton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The first line of the Sunshine List Law <clears throat> indicates very clearly that public disclosure is required for salary and benefits for anyone earning over $100,000 in the public sector. For years, New Democrats have been calling for bringing public sector executive pay under control. Now, according to the government Sunshine List, the CEO for OPG earned $787,000. However, according to OPG itself, that amount is close to double that and more like $1.4 million. Now, on one hand, we have the government disclosing one amount. On the other hand, we have the OPG itself disclosing another amount. The question is simple, how much did the CEO for OPG actually earn? Thank you, Senator. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to respond to the member on this uh, on behalf of our Minister of, of Energy. And the fact is the current uh, CEO, Jeffrey Liash, uh, is earning 3% less than his predecessor, Mr. Speaker. And I've got to tell you, when you look at this kind of position, uh, this is, I mean, you're talking about a CEO that is, is in a position that you have to globally compete for that talent. These are the folks, Mr. Speaker, that are running our nuclear units. Uh, these are the folks that are running our entire energy production system. These are not the places where you would go to get anybody that is anything less than the best in the world, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that Ontario power generation and our energy system is operating efficiently, effectively, and safely. Safely. So, Mr. Speaker, Answer. this is not the place to go when it comes to trying to discount people's earnings. This is a place where you want the best Thank in you. the world, and that's what we have. Yeah. Supplementary. In case anyone forgot, the question was about disclosure, and there was absolutely no answer to that question. For more than a decade, the Liberals have promised to bring public sector executive pay under control. Now, in fact, they passed legislation in 2014 to try to address this issue, and now they're promising to do something on this issue again. It was a stretch goal for the Liberals back 10 years ago, and it's a stretch goal again right now. On top of all of that, we have information before us that this government has not been disclosing the full truth in their own sunshine list. Now, Ontarians deserve transparency. That is something they have a right to have. Now, my question is simple. Given the lack of information provided by this government, how many other public sector executives are earning more than what the government admits? Question. Thank you. 
Minister. Uh, to the President of the Treasury Board, Mr. Speaker. Well, President uh, Treasury thank Board. you, Speaker. And I, I think, um, uh, as, as the Minister uh, said, the income reported for Jeff Lyash on the 2015 Public Sector Salary Disclosure Act was $787,472. That included his entire signing bonus plus his salary for 2015 from August to December, Speaker. He started in his position as CEO in August. When it comes to the broader question of executive compensation frameworks, we are moving forward with developing those frameworks for executive compensation. It is not a simple task. It is not as simple as they claim, just make it double the premier's salary. We're taking a thoughtful approach. Uh, we started with the college and university sector. The frameworks are now out for consultation. We are moving forward with agencies, Sarah Speaker. So it's important Answer. that we get this right. We need to find the right balance between attracting the right people and having reasonable levels Thank of you. compensation. Question. The member from Durham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Minister, yesterday the PC and NDP caucuses voted against Budget Bill 173. Shame. That will serve to relieve the financial burden that many families face in post-secondary post education. Many of the students in my riding of Durham rely on the Ontario Student Assistance Program to help pay the cost of tuition. My constituents were very pleased about the many changes our government made to OSAP in the 2016 budget. Minister, would you kindly inform members of the House how our government is making post-secondary education more accessible and affordable across, across Ontario in 2016? Thank you, Minister thank you, of Mr. Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Durham for that excellent question. Mr. Speaker, our government strongly believes that all students, regardless of their background or circumstances, should be able to afford to go to college or university in our province of Ontario, and that's why we have decided to transform OSAP in the 2016 budget that will lead to more students receiving more generous offering grants and, in many cases, help students receive grants that man. exceed our institution. Mr. Speaker, on the student, the student associations, poverty reduction groups, and the colleges and universities have praised the introduction of a simpler and upfront Ontario student grant. The new Ontario student grant is a smarter way to allocate taxpayers' dollars and to help the students who need it the most. Mr. Speaker, it is unfortunate that the members opposite said no to the 2016 Answer. budget bill and therefore said no to real action to break down some of the main barriers to post-secondary education in our province of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. It is disappointed that the members opposite voted against Bill 173, but it is reassuring to hear that this government places such a high priority on providing access to education. So many people can get good jobs and actively contribute to our economic growth in this wonderful province. Minister, despite the significant improvements the province has made since 20, 2003, there remains a direct correlation between family income levels and the likelihood of, of attended co attending college or university. Minister, you have spoken a great deal about the needs of students. Could you talk further about the impact the moder modernized student financial assistance will have? Question. Thank, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Again, I want to thank the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government is working hard to break down the barriers that are preventing Ontarians from getting a post-secondary education which is why in September 2017, all college, all college, university and career college students who come from families with household income of less than $50,000 will have the Ontario Student Grant that will cover their tuition. In addition, more than half of the students whose household income is below $83,000 will receive grants that will cover or exceed the average cost of tuition. 
Mr. Speaker, under the new Ontario Student Grants, more than 150,000 students will have upfront grants that will cover more than the cost of average tuition, and 250,000 students yes, will have less debt than they would have under the current OSAP program. I am pleased, Mr. Speaker, that this government, under the leadership of Premier Wynne, has broken down the barrier for. We have a deferred vote on the motion for closure of the motion of second reading of Bill 100, an act to enact the Tra Ontario Trails Act 2015, and to amend various acts. Calling the members, this will be a five minute bill.
members, please take your seats. All members. On February 18, 2016, Mr. Coteau moved a second reading of Bill 100, an act to enact the Ontario Trails Act 2015 and to amend various acts. Mr. Crack has moved that the, the, that the question now be now put. All those in favour of Mr. Crack's motion, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Crack. <laughs> Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Madam Mayor, Mayor, Mr. Sousa, Mr. Sousa Ms. Wynn, Ms. Matthews, Matthews, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Hoskins Mrs. Sandals, Sandals, Mr. Duguid, Mr. Duguid Ms. McCharles, McCharles, Mr. Quinter, Mr. Quinter, Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole, Mr. Takar, Mr. Takar, Mr. Bardinetti, Mr. Bardinetti, Mr. Delaney, Mr. Delaney, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Gravel, Mr. Gravel, Mr. McMeekin, Mr. McMeekin, Mr. Chan, Mr. Chan, Mr. Moridi, Mr. Moridi, Mr. Coteau, Mr. Coteau, Mr. Coteau, Mr. Leal, Mr. Leal, Mr. Flynn, Mr. Flynn, Mr. Zimmer, Mr. Zimmer, Madam Lalonde, Madam Lalonde, Mr. Cadre, Mr. Cadre, Mrs. Albanese, Mr. Dixon, Mr. Dixon, Mrs. Manga, Mrs. Manga, Ms. Wong, Ms. Wong, Ms. Hunter, Ms. Hunter, Mr. Sergio, Mr. Sergio, Mr. Morrow, Mr. Morrow, Ms. Jassic, Ms. Jassic, Ms. Domerla, Ms. Domerla, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Baker, Mr. Baker, Mr. Ballard, Mr. Ballard, Mr. Dong, Mr. Dong, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Koala, Ms. Koala, Ms. Molly, Ms. Molly, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. McGarry, Mrs. McGarry, Ms. McMahon, Ms. McMahon, Mr. Milchin, Mr. Milchin, Ms. Naidu Harris, Ms. Naidu Harris, Mr. Potts, Mr. Potts, Mr. Rinaldi, Mr. Rinaldi, Ms. Verniel, Ms. Verniel. All those opposed, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Powers. Mr. Powers. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry San Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry San Muskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Monsieur Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Novo. Mr. Novo. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. <laughs> The ayes being 52 and the nays being 42, I declare the motion carried. Mr. Coteau has moved second reading of Bill 100, an act to enact the Ontario Trails Act 2015 and to amend various acts. Is it the pleasure of the House the motion carry? Aye. I heard a no. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Yay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Aye. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill. Same vote. Mr. Coteau has moved second reading of Bill 100, an act to enact the Ontario Trails Act 2015 and to amend various acts. All those in favour, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Coteau. Mr. 
Mr. Nackney. Mr. Nackney. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codry. Codry. Mrs. Albany. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nidu Harris. Nidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Horvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bantock. Mr. Bantock. Mr. Bantock. Mr. Novo. Mr. Novo. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madam Jelly. Madam Jelly Knox. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. The eyes are 77, the nays are 17. The eyes being 77, the nays being 17, I declare the motion carried. Shall the bill be ordered for third reading? Minister of Tourism, Culture, Sport. I'd like to uh, uh, send it to the Standing Committee on the Legislative Assembly. Yeah. As requested. There are no deferred further. Def uh, sorry, point point of order. The member from Benley. We would like to introduce long-term, uh, long-time family friend of ours who's in the visitors gallery today, Mr. Gamil Sagu. Thank you for joining us at Queen's Park. There being no further deferred votes, this house stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.